Committee, your thoughts as to how progressive you think the tax rises that you brought in across your period of, uh, as Chancellor are, and how progressive the tax reductions that you've announced just recently in the uh, spring statement are. Because there's been concern on the committee, and I think there's genuinely a, a variety of views on this, as to uh, whether this has done, been all done in a fair way on the tax front, uh, or whether it's uh, not been helpful enough to those who have been hardest up. Yep, um, happy to do that. So in terms of the overall tax burden, uh, you're right, it is forecast to rise. And I think the important thing there is to think about what's the right baseline to compare it to. And yes, is it forecast to rise to 2019? Yes, it is. But that was before we got hit by a pandemic and the biggest economic shock in 350 years, borrowing that spiralled up to World War II levels. So I think to ignore what's happening uh, on, uh, to ignore that when thinking about the tax burden is not really fair or an apples to apples comparison. The, the reason the tax burden is rising very simply is because public spending is also rising as a percentage of GDP. So yes, tax to GDP is forecast to, to be at relatively high levels. So is public spending forecast as a percentage of GDP. Are you worried about the level to of public very, spending? Well, let's, let's finish the question on tax yeah. first. Mm -hmm. Forecast to be very high as a percent of GDP by historic standards. And I think most people would kind of get, yes, we have to raise the money to pay for the things that the government is spending on, right? So they, they, it's unsurprising that those two things move together. You can't talk about one without talking about the other, uh, unless you think the answer is that we should just borrow lots and lots and lots and lots. But as you said already, the headroom we have is, is not very much and, and could easily be wiped out. So I don't think that is the responsible thing to do. I really don't. So that's why we're in this situation. So we're continuing to invest significantly in public services. We have not gone down the route of austerity to square this circle. Right? We, we had expansive plans to invest in levelling up and public services. We got hit by a pandemic that shrunk the size of the economy. And then we had a choice. Right. Then we had a choice, and the choice was, well, should we do austerity and scale back considerably on all those investments in the NHS, in police officers, policing, on levelling up, and transport infrastructure, social care, etc., or do we need to raise the money to pay for them? And we've chosen the, the latter route. So that's, in, you know, the, the scheme of what's going on with the tax burden, that's the story of it, right? It's linked to the pandemic and an expansive set of public spending plans uh, and a desire to as I said, get our borrowing back to a responsible level and debt to be falling again in a couple of years' time. Now, in terms of the individual measures and whether they're fair and progressive, I am, I am very confident that they are. Uh, if you look at the two measures that were announced and legislated for in 2021 20, uh, spring budget, which are the two measures that largely solved the problem of coronavirus on our public finances, uh, one was a rise in the corporation tax rate, so large companies that are profitable will pay more in corporation tax. 70% uh, of companies will be exempted from that change. Their corporation tax rate will stay the same, but the largest, most successful companies will pay more, but still at a rate that is internationally very competitive, lowest in the G7, fourth or fifth lowest okay, in the G20. I'm keen to stick to how progressive these are. Got, got so, well, that's, well, that's where, so that, yeah. that was one measure. The other yeah. measure in that budget was freezing the income tax person allowances, yeah. which was widely recommended by a range of different people as being a progressive way to raise money. That it, just by nature of the income tax system, which is progressive, obviously freezing thresholds raises more money from those on higher incomes. It also does so in a way that supports the recovery because it builds over time. And of course, people are not cash losers from that because it's about a threshold increase rather than uh, taking cash out of people's pockets. So those two measures, I think, are progressive. They were described as such. And as I said, the, you know, large profitable businesses and a progressive way to raise money over time. Now that's that. Now then, in terms of the health and social care levy, there are, there are three ways you could have raised that amount of money sustainably, in my view. One's VAT, one's national insurance, and one's income tax. There are, you know, I think of those three, the VAT is the least progressive, so the choice is left between income tax and national insurance. And people will have their view as to which one of those would have been the better base for the levy. I think we've already had that debate here and we went through it. And there are reasons why income tax is progressive, potentially more progressive than national insurance. Uh, but there are other downsides of income tax as well, which we discussed last time, not least that it's not a UK-wide tax in the same way anymore. Businesses don't contribute to it directly in the same way. And there's no history in this country of operational or other hypothecation of that tax to the health service the way there is with national insurance. Anyway. Uh, but I think no one can say that national insurance is not a progressive way to raise that money. 
top 15% of Nick's payers will contribute over half the revenues from that levy. It was described by IFS, Andrew Dillnot, many others, as a progressive way to raise the money. Um, so I think the way we've raised the money has been very progressive. And in terms of the tax cuts, if you look at what we announced last week, uh, a raise to the national insurance personal threshold uh, to 12,500 pounds, 12,570, was again described when it was announced uh, in the campaign as the best way to help low and middle earners through the tax system. So that's what the Institute of Fiscal Studies said, uh, and that's because obviously it is a flat rate 360 pounds disproportionately benefits those on low and middle incomes. So I do believe that, that was the most progressive way to reward work through the tax system and cut taxes on working people. Um, and I, 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 I'm not, so do I think the tax cuts we're doing are progressive? Yes, I do. We started uh, there. Or actually, we started uh, back in October by cutting the taper rate in universal credit mm -hmm. very significantly um, from 63% to 55%. That's a two billion pound tax cut, improvement in the generosity of universal credit, that disproportionately benefits those on the absolute lowest incomes in a universal credit. Do you think credit. universal so, credit is generous? Hold on, can I come to other you in, members? In but, but so, so, Chair, yeah. in terms of the, those yeah. are the two personal tax cuts yeah. that we've announced in October and, and just now, I do believe they're progressive and, yeah. and that's okay. the reason. All right, Dan. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, and obviously we published our normal distributional oh, yeah. analysis, yeah. which shows that the decisions taken since 2019 will by 2014, where we'll be at the end of um, yes. the parliament, uh, which shows that the, the impact of tax is progressive as a percentage of net income yeah. by decile. So, yeah. okay. uh, For what it's worth, personally, I would probably accept most of that. But if we pick up on your point about the taper rate, so the taper rate, you're right. If you're in work and on UC, that's quite a valuable uh, boost to your income. But if you're not in work and you're on UC or benef other benefits, what, what was it in the statement that you've just delivered that if I'm in that situ situation gives me any cause for hope when it comes to the cost of living crisis? I think, first of all, for those on UC, it's important to remember that I think close to two thirds uh, either are or can work. Right. So the vast majority of people on UC are in that category. So they will benefit not just from the taper rate, but from the increase in the national living wage and the considerable support on the spending side that we are providing to help people get the skills they need to find their first job or a new job that pays them more. So there's an enormous amount of spending going on, a 26% real increase over this parliament in skills spending, 3.6, 3.8 billion pounds uh, annually, and that is going to all help those people as well. So that's the vast majority of people will benefit from all those interventions. Uh, and then for those that can't, there are, there are a range of different things. Uh, the Household Support Fund, which we announced an extra half a billion pounds for. To Very small in the context targeted, of the total amounts well, involved well, here. It's, it's targeted support to those yeah. who need it most. That comes on top of the significant energy support package that was announced in February to take uh, effect just in a couple of weeks. Can I stop you just, just one second, up, Chancellor? Which, yep. Can I just stop, stop for one second? So when we had the OBR in just now, we asked them about how much it would cost, for example, to uprate benefits by the rate of inflation rather than pegging it to the number back in September. Yeah, it would be about, over the scorecard period, it would be about so, £25 billion. Yeah, pounds. so they gave a figure of £11 billion, which I guess is probably in the... Yeah, so over the, the scorecard period, it would be £25 25. billion. Pounds. Yeah, uh, so, so your £500 million, although it is, your right, targeted, and it's useful in that sense, and part of the art here is to keep trying to target, and I know it's got rough edges and it's difficult, and I totally accept that. Um, is quite a, re a relatively very small amount, isn't it, compared to the uh, amount of money that it would cost to actually increase uh, those benefits in line with, so if we with just, what inflation is actually doing. If we just go through some of the other things, though, so there's obviously... But on, on that fund. point, though, before... Yeah, we but I think, other, well, yeah. there's also the increase to the local housing allowance that was put in place during the crisis and kept, which is worth about £600 to a million and a half people, which is uh, an extra billion or so pounds. Uh, that This year, there's £670 million to help about 3 million people um, with their council tax payments in a, you know, already in place uh, and the energy package is disproportionately beneficial to those on the lowest incomes or not in work as a percentage of, of okay. their so, so there are various budgets. things going on but we can't really get away from the fact that if you're out of work and in benefits there was very little really mm -hmm. in the spring statement 
uh, particularly when you take into account the number that you've just shared with us and what the OBR told us earlier about the cost of that up rating overall and in the context of the 500 million pounds that's been set aside for the for the household hardship fund so or whatever the, it's called. Which is what we've done previously mm. as well and it's it's support that is well targeted to local authorities knowing who are the most vulnerable families are in their areas. But as a, gen as a general yes, point sorry. about you know, if, if, if someone's view is that government can or should make everybody whole for inflation, particularly inflation at these levels caused by global supply factors, um, then that's something that I don't think is, is no, no. doable. And nobody's but, saying but that. But just, nobody's just to give... You well, but that, I think you that, can't that, make up for the whole of this external but that, that shock. Is the, but it's about, that is, where, you, it's about yeah. where you put the support and, and what it amounts to. And I'm just pointing out, I think that yeah. there is and, and, this particular and, group who are yeah. probably struggling quite a lot and who have had, it appears, less support than perhaps other areas. Now, there may, may be good reasons for that, but so, I think that's something we can't quite entirely step away from. And then these these are all choices. So yeah, yeah um, the choices that we have made are to cut fuel duty because, given the cost of petrol and mm. the vast majority of people reliant on their cars, that's a very significant two and a half billion pound tax cut um, that that's come in and will benefit the vast majority of people and everyone who is using their car. Uh, to cut the tax on working people by six billion pounds, three hundred and thirty pounds a person for thirty million people in work. I think it's the right thing to do, particularly because some of the other things we've had to do have increased the tax burden, as we've previously discussed. So it's right that there is a priority there to start now cutting taxes for those people. Um, and so I do think those are the right things to do, and there's targeted support that we've provided to those uh, that you've described. Um, but also an, an enormous amount to help people move from welfare into work, uh, both on the spending and on the tax side, which ultimately is the most sustainable route out of poverty. On the up rating to benefits and this point about it being pegged to September, 3.1%, inflation is heading, as we know, towards 8%, could be 9% even more. Did you consider any measures along the lines of trying to smooth that pain across from the September reference point to the next September reference point? Were there any approaches that you potentially had in mind there? And I'm curious as to why you might not have explored that or done something around that particular issue. Well, there's, there's an operational question, which, which Dan can speak to in a second, where there is actually just a four to five month actual operational lag between a policy decision and the system being able to implement it be because of how the DWP systems work, so that it is actually not possible to do it in a short space of time, actually, in the, in the first instance. And one of the systems, I think, can only do it once a year in any case. Uh, and secondly, it kind of goes back to the broader point that we were discussing earlier is, and that's about borrowing. Right. And what is a responsible amount of borrowing at a time when we are worried about the macroeconomic outlook, particularly with regard to interest rates and inflation? And we are already now forecast to borrow in this forthcoming year about 60% more as a percentage of GDP than our post-war average, almost 20% more as a percentage of GDP than we were forecast to borrow in October. So it's already a significant amount of borrowing and you know my job is to make the right long-term decisions and my view is that an excessive amount of borrowing now is not the responsible thing to do it's not the but, responsible but, thing to do both for the short term because it ha it may risk actually stoking inflation even further which is going to harm all the people that we're trying to help if we actually make the situation worse uh, and over time uh, you know having an irresponsible approach to borrowing and debt continue to so go no, up is no, not the right long term nobody thing would for advocate the, an irresponsible for the country. approach to borrowing and you've anchored your answer on borrowing but taxation is the the other balancing act here you chose to lower taxes you've chosen to make you're talking about two tax. different things in, in you're talking about 2022 but you so yeah, you're, you're but, right but you, that could have, a you could have put more relief into that out of work uh, you're through, absolutely right. So in this forthcoming year, borrowing. absolutely yeah. right. In this yeah. forthcoming year, yeah. uh, we made a choice to cut taxes on working people. 30 million people in work will benefit from the increase in personal tax thresholds, disproportionately those on lower middle incomes. You're absolutely right. Someone else sitting here could have said, "I'd rather spend that six billion pounds." on the welfare system, that's absolutely a choice that someone else could have made, yes. And what, why did you make it the way you made it rather than 
the because I think it. the other policies we've got to help people on welfare are the right approach to do that. They're more targeted, they help people move from welfare into work, and we're spending a lot and cutting the tax on the UC side to do that. So I think the mix of policies we've got is the right mix, uh, and also, as Dan pointed out, the distribution analysis that has been published is very clear that taken together, the actions of this government over this parliament are highly progressive. Thank you. Thank you very much.